It might appear strange to you that I wish to speak about practical matters of education from the perspective of a particular worldview, that of anthroposophic spiritual science. In fact, my reason for speaking about education originates here from educational practice itself. As you have just heard, the art of education, which I will speak about tonight, is being realized at the Waldorf School, and this has led me to broaden and elaborate the scope of anthroposophic ideas and aims for education. A few years ago, when educational questions were very much in vogue, the industrialist Emil Molt decided to found a school, initially for the children of the people working in his factory. He turned to me, asking that I give this school a fitting pedagogical curriculum and orientation. Initially, the pupils who attended, therefore, came from a very specific social milieu, the proletarian children of the Waldorf Company. And there were also a number whose parents were members of a society with a distinct worldview, the Anthroposophical Society. But the school's remit very soon broadened. We began with around 150 children in eight school classes, but before long we had 11 school classes with over 700 children. Following a lecture series on the art of education, which I gave at Christmas at the Gertianum in Dornach, attended by several members of the Anthroposophical Society, I was invited in August this year to give a cycle of lectures here in England at Oxford about the principles on which this Waldorf School is based. These lectures in Oxford led to the founding here of the Educational Union, with the aim of introducing more broadly in England the educational principles which I will speak about this evening. I wish to mention this context so that you do not have the impression that my discourse here tonight is merely theoretical. What I have to say is drawn from a real practical art of education. It is all the more important to stress this, since tonight, of course, I will only have time to give a few outlines. The ideas I describe will inevitably remain incomplete, since the educational principles I will speak of are not a fixed program, but a living practice. And this means that one can only offer examples drawn from this practice. It is, of course, easier to start from a theoretical program and offer general phrases, general maxims. But this is not possible in relation to the distinctive nature of the educational principles on which the Waldorf School is based, as I have said. This form of pedagogy and education has arisen from a spiritual, scientific worldview, one which can lead to real insight into human nature, and thus also to real insight into the nature of the child. When a painter or an artist in another medium practices his art, he needs to develop two capacities. Firstly, let's take the example of painting. He needs a certain skill in observing color and form must be able to create his works out of the nature of form and color. He cannot start from theoretical knowledge, but only from a living immersion in the nature of form and color. Then comes the second skill, the craft and technique of painting itself. From the perspective of anthroposophic spiritual science, pedagogy is not seen as theoretical knowledge, but as a real art one that works with the noblest material in the world, with the human being himself, with the child. From year to year, even from week to week, we can see the spirit and soul deeply concealed in the child as a divine dowry from worlds of spirit, emerging in his countenance, his gestures, and in every other way the child expresses his being. The pedagogical approach I am speaking of starts from the view that just as a painter needs to acquire skill in observing color and form, which turns in his hands, soul and spirit into craft and technique, so the educational artist needs to be able to observe and trace the way human nature develops and manifests in the child. 
This can't be done, however, unless we move on from a form of human observation implicit in ordinary consciousness to faculties that can really observe the life of soul and spirit. This, in fact, is precisely what anthroposophic spiritual science seeks to do. What we call knowledge today is really only able to concern itself with corporeal, sense-perceptible reality. As modern human beings, how do we learn to recognize soul qualities today without developing actual spiritual knowledge? We can only do this, really, by finding the soul's expressions and activities within ourselves. By trying to practice self-observation, we become familiar with our own thinking, feeling, and will, which are faculties of the psyche or soul. You can say that we only know about the soul by forming a view or judgment about it. Sensory impressions are given us, and we perceive them. But we only know about the soul by forming a view that something like a soul is at work in our own inner nature. Anthroposophic spiritual science, in the sense I mean it, does not start from this ordinary form of consciousness, but seeks to systematically develop powers slumbering in the human soul, so that, and please do not be alarmed by the expression, a kind of exact clairvoyance arises from them. In this way you can look through soul expressions to find the intrinsic nature of the soul. And then you can come to know this soul nature through spiritual perception in the same way that you can familiarize yourself with sensory color impressions through the eyes or sensory tones through the ears. But ordinary consciousness can only discern the spirit that holds sway in the world of deduction. In our ordinary awareness, we can only ever say that we see natural phenomena expressions of soul. From this we conclude that all this has a spiritual foundation. Our thoughts are concerned to discover a soul and spiritual quality underlying corporeal reality. But anthroposophic spiritual science develops powers slumbering in the soul. The spiritual sense organs, if I can use this paradoxical expression, by means of which we not only deduce the existence of spirit, but experience it ourselves in living thinking. Only when one perceives the soul, when one experiences the spirit in living thinking, can one gain real insight into the human being. Spiritual science can develop such a living knowledge of the human being that it can grasp human reality and observe at any moment in the life of the growing child how the spirit and soul are working in him. It not only enables us to see the child from without, as it were, through the senses, but also discerns how the soul reveals itself in sensory expressions. Rather than just basing its understanding on the way the soul expresses itself outwardly, It directly perceives soul substance as clearly as the eye can see color. It starts from insight into how the spirit works within a child by drawing on a form of knowledge that encompasses the spirit itself in living thinking. The art of education I am speaking of is therefore based on living knowledge of the human being on insight into the developing child at every moment of life. Only when we really perceive the nature of this noblest of all materials we can employ in art, the material used in the art of education. When we understand the human being in this way and act in truly pedagogical ways, can we discern things quite different from those available to ordinary awareness. Based on this kind of knowledge, this direct vision of the soul and spirit, one can then give guidance to teachers and educators on ways in which, through actual, practical involvement with the child, 
they can develop this soul and spirit in him. From living observation we can discover that the spirit is no less present in the child than in the adult. But this spirit is deeply sealed within and still has to master the body. When we ourselves can see the spirit, we gain a sense of the wonderful way in which it works in the child's organism as a divine gift, before the child can speak to us in language, before he can display intellectual thinking. We gain a sense that there is no divide between a person's physical and spiritual nature. We perceive the spirit working inwardly and immediately upon the child's physical nature, much more than can ever be true of the adult. The child's physical nature wholly imbued with spirit. As adults we possess spirit in the sense that our minds need it to think about the world. The child, by contrast, possesses spirit by virtue of needing it like a spiritual sculptor to first shape his own organism. Far more than one thinks our physical organism is created by the whole of our life, excuse me, is created for the whole of our life by what the spirit immanent within this physical organism accomplishes in childhood. But to avoid dwelling too long in abstract ideas, let me offer a few specific examples of what I mean. If we regard the child only by outwardly scientific means, his anatomy or physiology, rather than with spiritual vision, we fail to see how every gesture in the child's surroundings acts on his physical organism and takes effect there. Let us imagine someone shouts at a child who is engaged in doing something. It is quite different. It is a quite different thing to shout at a child or at another adult. If we shout at the child, we should remember that his organism is, as yet, in a quite different condition from the adult. The adult's sense organs are focused at the surface of his organism, and the impressions he receives through them are mastered by his intellect. He counters his sense impressions from within with his fully developed will. The child is wholly surrendered to the outer world. If I can put it like this, I am not speaking metaphorically here, but in real terms, the young child is entirely sense organ. I want to be very clear and precise here. Think of an infant. If we perceive him outwardly, it seems to us that he experiences the world, observes the world in the same way as an adult, with the only difference being that his intellect and will are not as developed as an adult's. This is not so. An adult tastes things, for instance, only on his tongue and palate. What in the adult has come to be focused at the exterior of the organism delves much further inward in the child. We can say that when he eats, the child becomes entirely taste sensation and entirely light sensation when light and color enter his eyes. It is not just metaphorical, but reality to say this. Light not only vibrates through the child's nervous system, but through his breathing, blood system, through his whole organism, whereas in adults it is really only active in the eye, iwai. The child is entirely sense organ, and in the same way that the eye is given up entirely to the world and light phenomena, the young child lives entirely in his surroundings. He bears within him spirit so that he can absorb all that lives in his physical surroundings with his whole organism. So imagine that you shout at a child. His organism responds in a very particular way. Something vibrates within him in a much stronger way than in adults who can resist this through the powers active within them. Your shouting will cause something like a faltering of the child's soul spiritual life. And the effect of this will be transferred directly to his bodily organism. If we shout 
at a child often and also alarm or frighten him, we are not only affecting the child's soul, but his whole physical organism. The health of an adult right into old age lies in our hands and is strongly affected by how we behave in his proximity. The most important aspect of educating a child in infancy is how adults themselves behave around him. If a child is exposed to perpetual hurried activity and busy rush, everything around him quick and fleeting, his whole physical organism will acquire an inclination to rush inwardly too. If we have developed discernment for the activity of soul and spirit in a child, We can tell by the time he is ten or eleven whether he has lived in a restless, hurried environment or one more calmly measured or one where activities were too slow or static. We can tell this from the way the child walks, from his step. A child who has grown up in surroundings where things were too rushed and where impressions kept rapidly changing will step softly and tentatively, not firmly. How a child absorbs his surroundings works right through his physical organism, into his step, his way of walking. We will find that a child in surroundings that have not offered enough stimulus, but have left him perpetually bored, will by contrast later walk with a far too heavy tread. I mention these examples because they are especially striking and show how we can become more subtly observant of children. In infancy, the child is what I would call an imitative being. He imitates his whole surroundings. But he also looks to the adult to imitate what he should feel inwardly or morally. Let me give an example of this. A father once came to me and told me that his son had always been a good boy, behaving in ways that elicited his parents' approval. But now suddenly, said the father, he has been stealing money. If we have some real knowledge of a child at this age, we will immediately ask something like this. Where did the child take the money from? It turns out that he took it from a drawer where his mother keeps it, taking money out of it every day. The child is an imitative being, given up to his surroundings, as soul-imbued sense organism. He brings his own being into movement to do the same as what he sees going on around him. In the first phase of childhood, exhortations, commands, and prohibitions have little meaning for him. They do not take root in his soul very strongly. The child is oriented only to what he perceives in his surroundings. But we have to remember that he sees things far, far more accurately than the adult, even though what he perceives does not come to full awareness. All he perceives around him shapes and informs his organism, and so his whole organism becomes a reflection of what he perceives. In modern views we greatly overvalue inheritance, genetics. Seeing what someone is like later in life, we assume that he is the way he is mostly because of purely physically inherited characteristics. But someone with the capacity to observe the child properly and to understand human nature will see how the child's muscles develop in response to impressions he receives from his surroundings, to the way we treat him with gentleness, love, or in other ways, how his breathing and blood circulation develop according to the feelings the child experiences. If a child often experiences someone approaching him lovingly and instinctively finding a tempo of experience with him that nurtures his inner being, the finer, subtler aspects of his respiratory system will develop in a healthy way. If you wonder where an adult acquires the foundations for a healthy physical organism, you should look on the effect his surroundings had on him as a child, when he was one entire sense organ. The words, gestures, the whole behavior of people around him and how this worked upon his muscles, blood circulation, and breathing. You will find that a child is not only an imitator as far as his language development is concerned, which relies entirely on imitation once the child has developed and strengthened his speech organs, 
But that the child's whole physical body and its subtler patterning is an imprint of what we do around him. And therefore, the way we live right through into old age, which is bound up with us having a stronger or weaker physical organism, and the extent to which we can depend on this, is something we owe, for good or ill, to the impressions our surroundings made on us when we were infants. I am speaking here of the first phase of childhood, when we are imitative beings. Real insight into human development shows that this lasts from birth to the change of teeth until the age roughly of six or seven. After the age of six, the child changes in more ways than are commonly realized. I will describe the child's further development along with sure foundations for educational practice and a real art of education in the second part of the lecture, after the first part has been translated. Around the age of six or so, at second dentition, this physical sign of change accompanies a deep-seated transformation of the child's being. Essentially an imitative being until the change of teeth, and dependent on the powers of imitation for developing his physical organism, the child around six at the change of teeth starts no longer to be physically surrendered to his surroundings, but instead to need to give his soul life to them. Whereas up to the second dentition, the child's being is deeply informed by everything in his surroundings, in this second phase, from the change of teeth to puberty, he is informed and formed by everything founded on the natural authority of those who bring him up or teach him. The child is not intrinsically drawn to learn the skills adults possess that he is taught, such as reading, writing, and so on. It is a huge mistake to think the child has the least intrinsic urge to acquire these skills of communication and expression of what you as adults have mastered. Everything that really helps the child to develop arises from his loving openness to your natural authority. If a child learns things, it is not because of any rational intrinsic, excuse me, of any rationale, intrinsic to what is taught. The child learns because he sees that the adult knows these things and can do them and because he hears from the adult who is his unquestioned authority as a teacher that this or that is the right thing to do and the right way to do it. This extends also to moral principles. Up to the change of teeth as I showed the child inevitably absorbs his sense of morality through imitation. From around six or seven to thirteen or fourteen, from the change of teeth to puberty, everything must be absorbed through the child's loving devotion to the teacher's natural self-evident authority. There is no point in trying to impose moral precepts intellectually, stating as a principle that something is good or bad but rather the child must develop within a feeling context in which the natural authority of adults shows him what he should consider to be good and likewise should consider bad. For the child there, could, there should be no other foundation for his pleasure in good or displeasure in bad than what is conveyed as such by the authority figure who stands beside him. He accepts this not because something appears to him intrinsically good or bad as an intellectual concept, but because his teacher finds it so. That is the important thing in a real, authentic form of education. Between the change of teeth and puberty, all moral education and all religious education too must come through an authentic human presence. The human relationship with the teacher is the all-important thing. When we appeal to a child's power of judgment, we are teaching him in a way that actually deadens a great deal within him. He is no longer entirely sense-organ, it is true, and his senses are now focused more outwardly on his body's surface, 
but his whole soul is within. He gains nothing from the intellectual element by means of which as adults we organically regulate and order our senses. A child at this age can, however, give himself to the natural authority of a teacher if everything is presented to him in an ensouled picture. This means, though, that between the change of teeth and puberty we must shape education in a thoroughly artistic way and always take art as our starting point. In our modern culture, the letters we present to children so that they can learn to write and read are something the child has no real relationship with at all. In certain civilizations, as we know, the forms of letters originated as visual representations of outer things and processes, as picture script. When we teach letters to children, we have to start again from pictures. That is why in Stuttgart, in our practice of the art of Waldorf education, we don't actually start with the letters as such at all, but with lessons in painting and drawing. This is hard with children starting school at six or seven, but these difficulties will be overcome if we stand next to the child with a natural authority, so that he gets the feeling he wishes to copy what the teacher is creating out of color or form, that he wishes to become like the teacher. This is how everything should be learned at this age, and can only be through an inner, not just an outer relationship between child and teacher, in which all lessons are imbued with aesthetic feeling. You see, imponderable factors are at work between the teacher and the child, not just the skills we may have acquired as a teacher, but above all our inner sense of things. Feeling and sensibility are at work, and the teacher's whole inner stance. And this acquires the right orientation if, as teachers, we can approach the spiritual nature of the world. Let me give another example to illustrate what I mean, and it is one I especially like to give. Let us assume we want to activate a moral religious sensibility in a child. The right time to do this, roughly, is around the age of eight or nine. The kind of education I am proposing makes it possible to perceive from the child's development that we should teach him in what we should teach him in each school year. Let us say that when he is eight or nine, I wish to teach him the idea of the soul's immortality. I can speak about this intellectually, yet not only will it make scarcely any impression on the child, but his inner life will in fact grow more arid in consequence. For to lecture intellectually to a child about moral or religious matters involves nothing of an inner nature. His inner life, his soul, thrives instead on imponderables, that must be at work between him and the teacher. Instead, I can convey an image to the child, a symbol, an artistic picture of what I wish him to grasp of the soul's immortality. I can say, quote, look at the butterfly's cocoon or chrysalis. The butterfly breaks through this, flies out of it, then flutters about in the sunshine. The same is true of the human soul. It lives in the human organism as the butterfly does in the cocoon. And when a person dies, it leaves the organism and henceforth moves through a world of spirit. Quote. But there are two ways in which one might do this. As a teacher, it is rather easy to think oneself very clever, to think I am clever while the child is not, and he cannot understand my clever or complex ideas about the soul's immortality. I will therefore make these concepts into a picture for him, so that he can grasp them in that lesser form. If I cobble a picture together in this way and feel myself to have a more sublime understanding, the impression the image makes on the child is only fleeting, and it will also cause something to wither in him. But I can approach the child differently, with feeling sensibility, and actually believe in this picture myself. I have not, I realize, fabricated it, but divine spiritual powers themselves place this butterfly cocoon and the emerging butterfly into the natural world, offering me a picture, an authentic one, 
something that lives in nature and embodies what I need to understand of the soul's morality, immortality. I encounter the immortality of the soul at a simpler, more primitive level in the emerging butterfly. God himself wished to show me this. You see, only if I myself believe in the images I convey to children will this remarkable, invisible, supersensible connection exist between us. And if I present to children something that really is my own deeply held view, this picture will take root in them and remain in them throughout their lives, developing as they do. If between the change of teeth and puberty we can transform everything into pictorial teaching of this kind, then we succeed in avoiding the inculcation of fixed concepts or precepts the child is supposed to adhere to in exactly the same form. Doing so it is like trying to harness a hand to a machine so that it cannot freely develop according to its own laws. Instead, we should convey inwardly mobile concepts to the child that grow as limbs do, and then what is presented in this way can change and grow through the decades, becoming different when someone is eighteen or twenty, and quite different again when he is forty. But to fully understand what is needed here, so that it really enters the whole art of how we teach, we need to do more than just observe the child in the present moment and ask what he needs and what developmental powers are currently at work in him. We also have to survey the whole of life. Let me give an instance. Let us assume that we succeed, between the change of teeth and puberty, in eliciting the child's inner sense of devotion to the teacher, as I described. The inevitable later consequence of this appears in a particular kind of strength and quality. Those who have some insight into such things will know what good fortune it is in much later life if they had the chance in childhood to look up to someone in reverence. Imagine, perhaps, that a child hears he will soon see a much revered relative whom he has never met before, is going to be allowed to visit him. After everything he has heard about him, the whole picture that has been conveyed to him, he makes his way to see this relative. In shy awe he sees the door opening. To look up to someone or something with such reverence is a huge thing. And in the soul of those who have had the good fortune to do so, something takes deep root and bears fruit much later, very late sometimes, in life. The same is true of everything that has been conveyed to the child in mobile, living concepts, rather than being inculcated or imposed on him. If a teacher manages to enable children to really look up to him as a natural authority, this engenders in them something I would express as follows. We know that there are people who at a certain age are a boon for the people around them. They may not say very much, but their words are a blessing to others. There is something in their voice rather than the content of what they say. It is a blessing for children to come close to such people. If we look back to the childhood of someone with this quality who may now be fifty or sixty and see what he was given between the change of teeth and puberty, what he learned then, we will find that he learned to revere, learned a moral reverence which taught him to look up in the right way to the higher powers in the world. He was someone who learned to pray in the right way, if I can put it like that. The reverence that develops through learning to pray truly is transformed, when he is older, into powers of blessing, into powers that make him a boon and a blessing for all around him. And I would say this too, to make it as vivid as possible, Someone who has never learned to fold his hands in prayer as a child will never develop the strength in later life either to pour out blessings upon others. Instead of forming a few abstract ideas and foisting these upon the child, therefore, we need to know how to work in a way that will develop something in his soul and be fruitful for him throughout his life. Thus, instead of inculcating abstract reading and writing directly, we start with writing, 
but conveyed artistically, allowing all the abstract letters of our alphabet to arise from pictures. And by teaching children to write in this way, we meet their need to be fully, actively involved, rather than just to use their head and faculties of observation. When a child learns to write in this way, out of pictures and with his full involvement, we give him what he needs. Once he has learned to write, he can then learn to read. Those who are too deeply rooted in mainstream education today will be worried that children would learn to read and write more slowly by this method. But it is worth questioning whether the age and speed of learning these skills is right in modern education. Basically, the child should only begin learning to read after the age of seven and in a way that develops everything out of a pictorial and artistic element. Someone who has gained real insights into human nature through true perception of the human soul and spirit will be able to observe things very subtly and from this observation develop an art of education. Let's say we have a child whose gait and step are too heavy. This will be due to the wrong kind of influences on his psyche before the change of teeth. But we can do a good deal to remedy such problems through the pictures we bring artistically to the child, which enliven him inwardly, invigorate what has been configured in someone before the change of teeth. Someone who has gained deep insights into human nature will therefore get a child with a heavy step or tread to spend a lot of time painting and drawing. A child, by contrast, whose step is too light or tentative, needs to engage more in music. And in fact, his whole character development later on, profound aspects of morality, depend on this. In each specific instance, if we are able to bring real understanding to bear, we can say how we need to approach the child with material that has been formed pictorially. Until the change of teeth, the child's natural surroundings are those provided by the proximity of his parents and family. But we must support this with nursery schools, play schools. We will only do the right thing for young children in helping them play and be active if we know how much things enter a child's physical organism. You should try to imagine that a child's blood circulation becomes sluggish and his physical organism is disturbed if he is given a ready-made doll, a so-called beautiful one, in quotes, with a beautifully painted face, all finished and perfect, in quotes. We have no idea what harm we do and how this works upon the child. If instead we ourselves make him a doll from a couple of cloths which we tie together in his view, then paint some eyes so that the child sees the doll being created in front of him, he will take this into the mobility of his organism. It will pass into his blood and his breathing and have an enlivening effect. Let's say we have a melancholic child before us. Someone who thinks in external ways rather than with soul vision will say that the darkness in a melancholic child must be alleviated by having very lively colors in his surroundings, toys colored yellow and red perhaps, and bright clothes, as vivid as possible to awaken the child from his melancholic state. No, that's wrong. You see, this would just give the child an inner shock, driving all his life forces in the opposite direction. Instead, we should surround a child who is melancholic or introvert with blue or purple colors and toys, and we should stimulate a child who is inwardly active by surrounding him with bright colors. This allows each to bring his own organism into harmony with his surroundings. A child who is too, too nervous or flighty will come into a healthier state through bright colors and movement around him. True insight into human nature, therefore, gives us direct help for the smallest details of our educational practice. If we educate in this way, we can see that ordinary assumptions about what a child learns at any age, what we should foist upon him, and how we should go about it, may need to be reconsidered. You see, a child can only 
draw from his surroundings what is already present as potential in his organism. And this realization leads us to deal more sensitively with children. Think of a child who tends to work in small or fine detail artistically, rather than to be robustly active in the material world. If we are determined to make him work more robustly, outwardly, his inner disposition and inclination for finer, subtler work will actually wither, while the capacities we wish to draw out of him because we obstinately think everyone should master them will disappear even more completely. The child will do what he is asked to to, between the change of teeth and puberty, but none of it will stick, nothing that is simply foisted upon him from without. The educational principle I am describing requires the teacher to have a fine sense of what is at work in each child, and then from what he observes as the child's physical, soul and spiritual constitution to find the right instinctive educational measure at any moment. In this way, really, the teacher can observe the educational needs of a child as he grows. In the Waldorf School, the curriculum is developed from this careful observation. Everything that does not have to be done on an ongoing yearly, weekly or monthly basis must be drawn from observation of the child so that we can give him what his inner nature requires. The profession of teacher is one that requires the greatest selflessness and therefore will get nowhere at all with predetermined programs. It must be focused entirely on working with the child as we stand beside him, through the relationship we develop with him, in a way that basically offers the opportunity for the child to develop in his own way and by his own powers. This can best be achieved through the ages of 6 or 7 and 14 at elementary school age if we refrain completely from appealing to the intellect, instead allowing an artistic sensibility to govern everything. At this age, everything directed at educating the child's body, soul and spirit can be clothed in images. Moral issues especially should be clothed in pictures when the child is 8 or 9. We ought not to give moral commandments, saying something is good or bad, but instead tell children about good people so that they can feel sympathy for them, or also tell them stories about bad people so that they can develop antipathy toward what is bad or wrong. Through images we can awaken morality in a child's sensibility. These are only brief hints and indications relating to the second phase of childhood. I will describe in the third very short part of the lecture, after the second part has been translated, how all this can become the foundation of a thorough lasting education. Not just one tailored to the brief years of childhood, but for the whole of a person's life. You will best be able to understand how the art of education I have described can from childhood on have the right effect on a person's whole life from birth to death if I illustrate this through one specific example, the art of eurythmy. Artistic eurythmy, performances of which have been given here in London in recent days, also has a pedagogical aspect. The art of eurythmy involves individuals or groups invoking movements from the depths of human nature, so that all such movements flow from the human organism in as lawful a way as human speech or singing. There is nothing arbitrary at all in a single gesture or movement of eurythmy. What we have instead is language made visible, music and song made visible too, a speech and singing through movement. In our speech, the whole human being's capacity for movement is restrained, held back. And what is metamorphosed in the audible tone is configured in the art of eurythmy into a visible speech. Now, we introduced eurythmy into the Walder School for the lowest primary class through to the oldest class, and it has become apparent that the child lives into this visible speech in which, just as every audible inflection expresses meaning 
in audible language. So every movement of fingers, hands, or the whole body is likewise really a speech sound, but one made visible. We have found that children at this change of teeth and beyond, through to puberty, live into this language as naturally as a very small infant finds his way into speech sounds. It becomes evident that the child's whole organism of body, soul, and spirit, for you see, eurythmy is at the same time a kind of gymnastics for the soul and spirit, finds its way into this eurythmy language in as self-evident a way as ordinary language was acquired. And the child feels that what he is given here flows directly from his whole organism. Eurythmy thus complements gymnastics, which originates more in observation of the external physical body. For here a person not only feels himself as body, as ensouled body, but also as spiritualized soul in a body shaped by the soul. So to sum up, in the art of eurythmy we experience something that works on our potential in an enormously living way, and likewise has a very fruitful effect on the whole of our life. However well you practice gymnastics with children, if it adheres only to the laws at work in the body, this will not protect them later from, say, all kinds of metabolic disorders and rheumatism itself in brief, from disorders that later become metabolic diseases. What is drawn from gymnastics tends, in fact, to harden and condense the physical body. But if you draw every single movement from the spirit and soul, this will give a person mastery of the mind and body throughout his life. External gymnastic movements in childhood will not prevent a sixty-year-old body from becoming frail. But if you educate a child to perform gymnastics drawn from the soul, giving him a pictorial education between the change of teeth and puberty, in which an image that otherwise remains an inner one passes soul spiritually into the body, you will prevent the body from getting brittle as it would have done. You see, this picture language is nothing other than ensouled, spiritualized gymnastics. And this ensouled and spiritualized gymnastics helps the child develop evenly in body, soul, and spirit, so that what we implant in him in childhood will bear fruit throughout his life. We can only do this if our attitude resembles that of the gardener who cultivates a plant. He does not try to artificially interfere with the movement of sap, to graft something alien onto it, but simply creates conditions and environment where the plant itself can grow. He is quite naturally wary of intervening in the inner workings of the plant. Such reverent wariness is something we too must have in the face of what is seeking to unfold into life in the child. We will not, therefore, keep trying to teach a child something in a one-sided or narrow way. The principle of authority I have described must hold sway in the child's soul in the profoundest way. And the child must be able to absorb things that he cannot yet understand intellectually, but picks up on because he loves his teacher. If we teach in this way, we are not robbing the child of the possibility of experiencing certain things in later life. If I understand everything while I am still a child, the following, for instance, will never come about. Let us assume that when I am thirty-five I have an experience of something which recalls what I once absorbed from a beloved teacher, a beloved authority figure, which I simply took then on loving trust. Now I am older and more mature, and suddenly a quite new understanding of what he meant dawns on me. This experience of returning at a later age with more mature understanding to something we once absorbed but did not yet understand, which now acquires new life, gives a person inner assurance and empowering of the will. And this is an experience we ought not to deprive people of if we have sufficient respect for their freedom and wish to educate them for freedom. 
The educational principles I have been describing here are based on educating people as free beings. This is also why we should not constrain the child's will by imposing intellectual moral judgments on him. We need to realize that if, between the age of six or seven and fourteen, we allow the child's sensibility to develop moral pictures through his own feelings of sympathy and antipathy, when the child becomes an adolescent with more intellectual understanding of moral feeling and what he himself wishes, then the aesthetic feeling developed when he was younger, which imbues his will, emerges from the will and comes to life in relation to morality. And because it kindles in a living context, in freedom, it endows a person with strength and inner certainty. Someone who tries to practice this kind of educational art is not just thinking of childhood, but of a person's whole life through to old age. He wants what he implants into the child to be like a flower that grows and thrives in the living context of its surroundings. When we plant a flower, we cannot try to force it too quickly. We wait patiently for it to develop in its own good time, from root to stem to leaf, then to flower and fruit, freely unfolding in the sunlight. This is the goal we keep in mind for a true art of education. In the child we want to cultivate the root of his life in such a way that the life of body, soul and spirit we help to thrive in childhood and youth gradually transforms in versatile ways. This we can be sure, then we can be sure that with full respect for human freedom our education enables a person to take his place in the world as a free being and that really the root of education can develop not by our grafting onto it something that enslaves it, but so that later in life, right into old age, a person can develop as a free human being in whatever circumstances he finds himself. These educational principles, of course, make the greatest demands on a teacher. That is certainly true. But surely we cannot imagine that the most highly perfected being here on earth the human being, can just be treated superficially and simply without us fully entering into his distinctive nature. Ought we not to approach the task of education with something like reverence and sometimes even as a kind of religious service? The art of education, as we need to realize, requires the greatest selflessness of us so that we forget ourselves entirely, immersing ourselves in the child's being and seeking there already for qualities that in the adult will help the world to thrive. Selfless care and the will to penetrate human nature with true insight, to keep deepening this insight, are the fundamental conditions for a real art of education. Education, after all, is the very finest aspect of human life, from which, of course, it is drawn. So why should we not devote our heartfelt energies to it? This is what makes for progress. The human progress we cultivate through education means that young generations whom we receive as a gift from divine worlds can develop by virtue of what we older generations have ourselves developed, moving humanity on a step further. We serve humanity, therefore, when as an older generation we draw on the best and most beautiful qualities we possess to serve the younger generation, when we practice the finest art of education in a way that most fully accords with human dignity.